All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Jeff, and uh, thanks a lot to the uh, scientific committee for for giving me the opportunity to be here and present our work. Uh, my first slide is already my acknowledgement slide as well, and I want to point out in particular uh, Allegra Aron and Rafael Rea, with with whom together I, I, I developed um, that approach and uh, performed the experiments. They unfortunately can't be here, and Rafael was actually meant to present this, so I had to step in for him. So what kind of like combines us on our interest a little is our fascination for natural products and in particular marine natural products. And if we look at like microbial communities in the ocean, for example, here, this uh, um, interactum of like a diatom and its surrounding microbiome, I think it's absolutely fascinating to think about how small molecules modulate functions of those communities. So this can be both on like the synergistic side, for example, with like siderophore exchange, um, but also like on the more like parasitic side where um, some of the microbes like produce like, for example, the proteases to actually digest the diatom and kind of like eat it alive. And I think it's particularly um, important and interesting to uh, think about this also in a larger scale, um, how those microbial communities actually like influence like uh, the entire planet and global carbon cycling, for example. So now what was actually my expertise uh, in this particular project and what I brought on the table is um, yeah, our developments in, in non-targeted um, mass spectrometry uh, based metabolomics in particular the use of, of LC MSMS in data dependent acquisition mode, which we typically use to analyze and characterize the chemical space and in, in environmental samples in this case, particular marine um, environmental samples. So now um, we combine this with, with molecular networking. And for those of you who do not know that, what we basically um, use this for is to kind of map out like the chemical space. So we take all experimental MS and MS spectra and then compare them to each other and organize them in um, a molecular network. We then dereplicate some of them against our spectral library and then draw them as such nodes in, inside of a network. And I think when we look at this example, this is Thing really like tempting because it kind of like facilitates this this complex data sets and then we may uh, do not know the identities of most of them but if we know some IDs we can propagate this to neighboring nodes and say hey these are maybe lipids, amino acids, peptides and, and so on. Now in combination with uh, um, feature finding tools we also get relative abundance which is particularly interesting for um, yeah statistical questions in, in a larger context and just to give you um, uh, a brief uh, overview. So this is all uh, available in the GMPS platform. And I think this is also the power of it because it's a community approach and, and you can update um, or upload like spectra to the library and actually contribute to like community knowledge, which I hope will, um, or many of us hope will kind of bypass one of the major challenges in, in metabolomics and that's like uh, spectral annotation. However, what uh, is probably most exciting for us here is that we also got access to quite a set of interesting um, samples. Working with Scripps Oceanography in, in San Diego, we got access to like a couple of cruises and, and a couple of like field studies. And over the years, we, we acquired quite um, an inventory of, of marine, marine samples. And I, I just want to highlight very briefly how that chemical diversity looks, for example, in, in this principal coordinate analysis, which basically displays sample to sample distance. And we can see how, how diverse these um, different my, um, environments are. And when we look at the global molecular network of all of that chemical space, I think it's absolutely fascinating to think about the chemical diversity, which is out in, in this world and how much is there to mine. So now we can like zoom in just to chemical space and, and look at like some particular examples. Then we see here, for example, a subnetwork of a natural product called Manoa Light, um, which has uh, um, been isolated from like sponges. And we see that there's actually like an entire family of, of different derivatives. And now when we have paired sequencing data, so we also have information about the microbial communities um, where these uh, compounds are found we can start constructing networks um, of the microbial community. And here in this particular case, this is from a data set from the California current ecosystem. We observed uh, uh, cyanobacteria, prochorococcus, and with correlation analysis, we can map out the surrounding microbial community. Now, as we have the chemical space map as well, we can correlate this too and kind of like display the molecular space within this, mole uh, within this microbial communities. And then we see, Okay, there's perhaps um, this um, homo serine lactone, so maybe in like the yeah 
surrounding uh, bacterial community, there's there's some like quorum sensing going on, and we also see there's actually manoa light to be found, which I found particularly interesting because uh, yeah, this was in an offshore environment, so not very um, in like the natural habitat of the sponges where where manoa light was described. However, what the important thing here is is that there is just a few annotations we have, and even if we can annotate um, some of those compounds. We actually don't know what their function is and, and what, what they're doing. So I think this is a really good example of the dark matter of the metametabolome of, of environmental samples. So now I think to, to shed light on that, what, what we have to do is systematically add functional analysis in parallel to um, yeah, like to the non-targeted metabolomic screening. And this is actually now the, the, the mission of, uh, of, of my lab. I, I just started in Tübingen, where we want to build like a functional metabolomics pipeline, where we combine um, sequence methods with, with non-targeted mass spectrometry and try to put some functional assays like in parallel into this pipeline. As we've just learned in, in the first talks, I think there's already like great ways to, to add bioactivity to non-targeted metabolomics and, and people are doing this already since like a long time. For example, in, during my PhD with Roderick Süßmuth in, in Berlin, I um, purified different extracts from a uh, um, plant pathogen, uh, Xanthomonas albilineans. And we then did some online splitting and, and took bioactivity measurements here with halo assays to then prioritize samples to take deeper dives into the metabolome. Yeah, besides like one known um, natural product here, albicidin, we worked with, we could does like map out the space like more in detail and actually find like an entire like family of, of these molecules. So I think this is this is really promising, but I think the challenge is that it does not really scale to like the same size of samples we can we can run by by non-targeted metabolomics. So what I think is, is very tempting there is why not using the mass spec to directly um, assign functions to to um, small molecules. And while there um, are a lot of like different methods, for example, affinity uh, mass spectrometry approaches, and I'm sure we're gonna learn some more about that in the, in the next talk. One technology which I find particularly tempting is native mass spectrometry. In case you don't know what native mass spectrometry is, what, what people try to do here is basically ionize intact proteins as a, at a type of uh, physiological relevant buffer conditions to maintain like the folding of like the protein and potential affinities to other proteins or other small uh, molecules in the gas phase. And then yeah, basically um, analyze those complexes. So now this is of course very, uh, I think cool because it like gives you also stichometric information and it, and it measures actually direct binding, but you need to have some sort of like purified compounds typically. So it does not work very well if you have like a very complex mixture of, of uh, different molecules as we would have in our um, environmental samples. So what sounded like a very like a logical step for us to do is to actually couple this with uh, HPLC and decomplexation of, um, of the metabolome at the first place, which also would perfectly fit to our LCMS based uh, metabolomics, of course. Now here you have the problem that LCMS with reversed phase is typically performed at like a, a low pH and it's like a acetonitrile or methanol as a, um, as a mobile phase. And, and that's of course not very like uh, a native. So what we actually came up with this is to, uh, to use like a, um, a post column uh, makeup flow where we can bring back the um, yeah, like low pH and like high acetonitrile conditions to bring this back to like a more physiological relevant pH as well as like um, dilute down the acetonitrile a little bit of makeup flow and then offer all the molecules that are looting a binding partner. And, and we tried this first with, with metals, which worked quite well, but now also moved on to, to proteins, which we post column and fuse. And then um, we observe like the intact mass. And when the um, small molecule is binding, then we see a mass shift in the intact analysis. So now we uh, tested this first with uh, uh, strapped abidine as a, as a very simple um, target molecule um, or target protein. And here's some um, cell lysates. And what you can see here is the intact uh, protein spectrum. And then uh, here we basically ex extracted as an extracted ion chromatogram, one of like the most abundant charge states. And what you can see very nicely is that it kind of like comes up at the beginning. This is when we turn on the, the syringe pump to infuse the protein. And then at the end, it goes down again. And in the middle, there's this like big negative peak where actually 
um, the signal like, uh, yeah, like um, uh, disappears a little bit. And when we look at the mass spectra at this given time point, we see, oh, it's actually like just shifting by um, like a particular mass. And if we make an X XIC from this new mass, we see, okay, that fits perfectly in this window. So now as we have the same gradient on the same machine for our metabolomics run, we can overlay um, this uh, yeah, data. And then we see that there is actually a correlating peak in, in this particular window. And because we know the mass difference between like the intact uh, protein peaks, we can see, oh, that's like 977. And in this case, uh, the small molecules, uh, 244 Daltons. And that roughly fits um, to that mass difference by four times. So here we probably have four binding sites. And as this was strapped abedine, and we know that biotin is a, is a very good <laughs> binder, this was not very surprising, even, but a nice kind of like uh, positive control. However, now we wanted to like try this with some real life samples. And uh, yeah, as, as I said, we were interested in marine environments and in particular cyanobacteria. And we knew already that many cyanobacteria make this protease inhibitor. So that was kind of our first target. So now, yeah, we had different opportunities, but we picked um, actually samples from, from my um, coworker, Rafael Rea, from uh, brain corals from Puerto Rico, and from a particular cyanobacteria called Rivularia. So now when we look at here, um, our native metabolomics run, we see something very similar as before. We see here this negative peak at around five minutes, and that corresponds to a peak here in our metabolomics run on the right at five minutes. And then again, we can like look at the mass shift, uh, which is like uh, uh, 1155. And that fits very well here to the M plus H uh, plus species at around 1156. Uh, so now we have a potential binder here. But what I think is like most exciting about this is when we start deconvoluting all like the multiple charts spectra. So we now have a kind of artificial, um, yeah, like, uh, zero charged spectrum and we start scrolling through this chromatogram and when you see here now on the right uh, there's like all like this new peaks appearing so basically every couple of seconds when another um, metabolite eludes we see that there is potentially binding of a new of a new um, molecule and i think this really shows like the depth of how many putative binders are in um, this particular sample so now as we have um, the, um, the metabolomics run from those samples, we can start pairing them. So here we have uh, our bioinformatics pipeline. We do feature extraction um, of both the native run and the metabolomics run, and then do some uh, matching by mass and retention time, and then actually organize those putative binders to the protein in our molecular network. As we have MS2 spectra as well from the metabolomics run, we have already our classical molecular network based on structural similarity of the small molecules. But now, yeah, we can basically take all this binding information too and then uh, put this here in this molecular network. And what you can see here now is chemotrypsin as our protein target in the middle. Binding is indicated through like the red dashed line. And then the gray lines are like all like the um, similar molecules that are clustered together by their ms ms similarity. As you can see there is a nice family of them, uh, some of which were known, but also we found like one particular new family, which we called Rivularia peptolites. And thanks to the work of my um, colleague, Raphael, he purified some of them and could actually get the planar structures solved by NMR, which also allowed us as we had pure compound available to then um, do like some binding studies to estimate um, uh, KD values which showed that they were actually pretty potent. And then also confirming their um, activity with some orthogonal um, uh, competition assays, which showed that the Rivularia peptolites are um, actually protease inhibitors in, in the nanomolar range, which I thought was quite good. So yeah, taken together, I, I think that this is a, a nice method to um, yeah, assign function or um, particular protein binding um, capabilities of small molecules in a high throughput scale. And if we now put this data back into our database, I hope that this will help um, yeah, adding function more systematically to, to non-targeted metabolomics experiments. And yeah, hopefully shed some light onto this dark matter of the meta metabolome as we keep doing this with more uh, protein targets or other biomolecules in the future. Okay, with this, I wanna thank you for your attention and um, also, again, my coworker, especially 
Allegra and Raphael, as well as my new colleagues in, in Tübingen. And yeah, if that sounds interesting to you and you, you want to try it out and eventually come and join us in Tübingen, we're currently looking for a postdoctoral researcher to work on that project. Thanks. Uh, thanks for a great talk, Daniel. That was really interesting. Looks like we have some questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, how do you choose your protein targets? And because you do an XIC, do you think that you'd be able to do more than one isolated protein in a run, or would that just be too convoluted? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, that's uh, that's what we're thinking to to go to. But yeah, we wanted to start with like um, a simple protein, and also we had, the, as I said, like the rational of like protease inhibitors, which. Yeah, I think cyanobacteria are quite known to to make those, but we we tried it already with some with some other targets, and I think that's now future work we want to like build up on in, in Tübingen. Great, thank you. Thank you. It was a really nice talk. I have a question about like in a native MS, like after binding a metabolite, have you ever had a chance to look at the structure change of the proteins, like using ion mobility or some other other fragmentation method? No, we did not. So we don't. We simply don't have the instrument available. But it, this would be a really interesting uh, thing to do, of course. I have another question. So when you are when your proteins are binding to metabolites, so I feel like sometimes you need a more than a couple of seconds to them to be in equilibrium. So, so I'm curious, like how long does it take from like when you inject your metabolite and to the mass spec? Like is that a like few second unit or like more than that? Sorry, can you repeat the last part? So I am curious, like how long does it take from when you inject your metabolite into the mass pack? So I'm curious, how long does it take for the protein and metabolite are being equilibrium mm -hmm. between them? Yeah, thanks. So how long it takes? So it, it's really short, right? So that's why I think this method is, works really well for like, um, yeah, like strong binders and probably not so well for, for example, covalent binders. So it has its, its caveats, obviously. Thank you. So I had a question. So have you, for this example, the chemotrypsin, have you taken a look at, say, the crystal structure of that to try to understand, are these small molecules binding yeah. to the same sites or yeah. different sites? Yeah. So we, we didn't do crystallization experiments, but with a friend of mine, Ido, who's, uh, I, I think I did have him in the acknowledgement, um, we, we did some docking studies. And it actually shows, like, the, the comparison of monoalite to uh, Rivularia peptolite to, like, yeah, seem to like fill that pocket like better, but obviously this is like in silico um, evidence, not not real crystal. And then, and then oh, sorry, question out there. Uh, yes, you were showing the slide actually a complex protein, actually it was created by four tetramers, right? And each mer of the protein had actually binded uh, the small molecule. Mm -hmm. So do you see that actually also ions were actually only partially binding is actually? At, um, so, at yeah. Yeah, so in, that was in the case of like um, strapped avidine. And as you could see in, in, that, in that mass spectra, it actually shifted completely over. But yeah, strapped avidine biotin is, is such a strong binding. I think that was a really like good example for like the first test, right? Because that's kind of like bulletproof. Um, so there we did not see partial, partial binding. I would assume that for like, if there's a weaker binder that has multiple sites, we, I would assume that we probably get like an equilibrium. Great. One last, I guess, one final question I had it was: What are the limits in terms of molecular weight that you can use in this approach mm -hmm. based upon the mass spectrometer? That you yeah, have? yeah. So I think this is this is a really interesting question. I, I was wondering that as well, and I was actually talking to one of like the pioneers in, in native mass spectrometry yesterday, Michael Marty, who is also a really nice guy, um, and he, and he said like the main limitation is accessibility of the protein now for 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 contemporary native mass spectrometry. So not so much like the mass spec part um, anymore. So yeah, I, I really hope that, that we can like push this and yeah, as we get our hands on, on different protein targets, like try this out with like more complex, uh, even like not like monomers, but like complex, uh, yeah, protein complexes. Great. All right. Well, thank you. And let's thank Daniel again. Thanks.